was surprisingly pleasant. Like I've mentioned, before this little project of reviewing every single season of Survivor, the only uh, seasons prior to Panama that I'd ever watched were Borneo. That was because Hulu didn't have all of the seasons, and that was where I used to watch Survivor, so I just jumped straight from Borneo into Panama. So far we've had three forays into old school Survivor. Thailand, All Stars, and Guatemala. One was pretty terrible, one was pretty good, even if keeping in character with the producers, I consistently forget it exists and therefore forget to put it in the rankings, and the other was something that was so complicated and so monumental in Survivor history that I honestly found it difficult to judge it fairly. I'm still not even sure I did a very good job of it. In fact, I'm pretty positive. For the next few episodes, we'll be reviewing some of those old school seasons, presumably because when doing the rankings, people like me who hadn't watched these seasons didn't really know what to make of them, so they pretty much just st happened to be stuck around the middle rankings. So for the next few months, I'll be going in completely blind as I don't have any preconceived opinions as to what the season is like because I don't know anything about them. All Stars was different because it's been talked to death so much that I felt like I had already watched it, but Africa, Marquesas, and Vanuatu? The only things I know about those seasons are Ethan, Boston Rob, and Eliza. That in mind, I liked it. Yeah, it was good. The characters were enjoyable, the alliances made sense, it was sometimes voyeuristic watching them survive in hellish conditions. I will say, of all the old school seasons, this one is perhaps the best showcase and example of the appeal that comes from when the show was more about survival. Not necessarily because I enjoy watching them suffer, watching them be afraid that they'll be eaten by lions and pee blood, yikes, but because there was something so inherently fascinating about watching them survive in such a tough climate, but because it's just so inherently fascinating to me. Kenya is not a very pretty place. At the time of writing, having already watched the first couple episodes of Marquesas, I can already very much say that I find that way more visually appealing than Africa. Uh, hell, even the repeated use of Fiji is prettier, but there's just something about this location that is so stunning. This season definitely carves out its own identity for the breathtaking location alone. It's brutal, it's barren, it's unforgiving, it's striking. It's gorgeous to look at the same way a Lovecraftian monster is. By all accounts, this should not be aesthetically pleasing to the eye, and yet that's exactly why it's so mesmerizing. The sheer power and apathy towards your survival. For the first time, I'm not at all in any way jealous of the contestants. This is a landscape meant only for the strongest. But the strategy is also very pleasantly complex. These first few seasons are characterized by their lesser focus on strategy. Usually how it would happen is that there's two tribes, and going into the merge, whoever had more tribe members would just pick off the other tribe. And if the tribes were tied, as they usually were, whoever they targeted that had the most previous votes went home, because ties were decided by past voting records. It seemed to be going in that direction again, until production decided to shake things up a bit. Something I already knew going into this, this was the first season with a now regular tribe swap. It happened a bit differently though. Instead of being decided randomly, the tribe picked three people to go on an unspecified mission, and those three people ended up swapped onto the other tribe. But actually, we need to back up. At the start, like every season before, there were two tribes of eight. One tribe kept losing challenge after challenge, going to the first two tribal councils right off the bat. They were paradoxically also the only tribe that was cohesive and actually got along. Mostly. Diane said it, the best thing to do would be to open and get her something to eat, you know, because we wanted to get her strength up. She said, well, maybe something to eat will help. So I said, well, I'll do that. I'll open up a can, get you, maybe get some food in you, and that'll make you feel better. Uh. We'll get to that. The other tribe, Samburu, had a very clear old versus young divide, with one half doing all the actual camp work and the other not. The alliances started forming accordingly with only one bump in the road. For a time, it looked like Silas would actually join the older group, creating a majority alliance of five. Silas eventually decided to align with his peers, and they went to their first tribal council on day nine. Because the tribe was split 4-4, and none of them had actually gone to tribal council before, this was a deadlocked tie. I was on the edge of my seat. I had not known how a deadlocked tie was dealt with back in the day, so I didn't know what to expect. And then the tiebreaker quiz was nail-bitingly intense. As a youngster myself, I happened to side with the young people, 
and that was great because I was actually invested and at the same time I didn't know who was going home because amazingly I was not spoiled for any of this. This had to have been the most exciting moment of gameplay ever at this point with the obvious exception of everything that happened in Borneo because it was the first time any of it was happening. My sister thinks it's unfair that in a game of social politics and strategy that the vote was decided by was, was ultimately a quiz but I thought it was the perfect marriage between the survival and strategy aspects of the show. With the young people now having the majority, they start picking off the rest of the tribe. They might have succeeded had it not been for the aforementioned tribe swap. The young people alliance gets split up. Silas, Frank, and T-Bird get swapped onto New Boran, leaving Lindsay, Brandon, and Kim Powers on New Samburu with new members Tom, Kelly, and Lex. And this is where things get interesting because you see, usually when tribe swaps happen, even nowadays, the majority tribe picks off the outsiders that have just been swapped up to the new tribe. Here though, ironically, the first tribe swap in Survivor history might also be the most strategically complex. Because Samburu already had huge fractures in the tribe, it made it easy for some members to throw others under the bus when different chess pieces were allowed to join them on the board. I mean, can you hardly blame Frank and T-Bird? Had it not been for this Hail Mary, they would have been the next to go home, in no small part thanks to Silas. Why should they show him any loyalty? Wonderfully, the dynamics on the other tribe are not any less static. There is no bad blood between any of the tribe members, because that tribe has a 3-3 split, and this time there is no bad blood between any of the previous tribe members. The young alliance is mostly intact, so their next step is not letting the old Boran members figure out who of their ranks has previous votes, because it could seal their fate. A task not made any easier by Lindsay's constant whining and freaking out about her previous votes. Yeah, she gets kind of annoying during the stretch, and the audience's sympathy for the alliance, if any ever existed, mostly gets pissed away thanks to Lindsay's constant bitching and moaning. To the point where we're actually thrilled at her elimination over Lex, even if, like Kelly, some of us wish that they could have just gotten rid of Lex right then and there. The Samburus vote Tom, and the Borans vote Lindsay, and the Young People Alliance has officially ended, meaning I no longer have to say that ridiculous alliance name ever again. Anyway, this pre-merge is spectacular. I honestly felt like I was watching a middle-era season half the time, that's how good it was. All the people telling me that the focus is more on the brutality of the location over the strategy had me thinking that this was going to be some sort of snooze fest, but there's a lot of good stuff here. The dynamics are clear-cut, the characters are incredibly well-developed, usually I have a tough time at first differentiating the different people and putting faces to names, but here the relationships and alliances are all so very well developed that I have no trouble understanding everyone's motivations. Admittedly, this is more accurate for one tribe than the other. Uh, Boron probably gets a little too worked up on their beef with Clarence for eating too many cherries. Uh huh. And admittedly, the Boron girls kind of get pushed to the side in favor of focusing more on the all sausage fest alliance that is Ethan, Big Tom, and Lex, otherwise known as the only returnees from this season. Funny how that works out, huh? But all in all, this is still a very successful pre-merge. This season has a couple of really great episodes after the merge, but to be honest, the season has already kind of peaked. After some brilliant paranoia stemmed from T-Bird throwing a hinky vote Lex's way and the chaos that ensues, the season mostly falls into the familiar pattern of the majority tribe picking off the minority. Points for not being a complete begonging, and also points to Kim Johnson, the outsider of that alliance, for winning her way to the end. I know I'm stretching the definition of won her way to the end since they were only the last two immunity challenges, but honestly those are probably the most important considering that if she hadn't won those she very definitely would have been going home. Anyway, there are some interesting moments from the first couple episodes after the merge. So the tribes walk in with six Barans and four Samburus, the first time one tribe actually has a numbers advantage over the other tribe. Clearly, this means that the Borans will work together, put aside their differences, and do what needs to be done to pick off the minor- and Clarence and Kelly are voted off back to back. Okay, I guess not. So apparently, since Clarence is still being punished for eating some cherries, among other things- Fine. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's just- ugh, I can't wait for season 40 and the promise of a more diverse cast. Ugh. Everyone decides to vote out Clarence, which of course the Samburus are very happy about because, hey, the chance to vote out a Baran that's being spearheaded by another Baran? Count me in! But T-Bird, lovely T-Bird, is wondering why everyone's just 
following Lex's orders. So she decides to have a little fun and throw a vote his way. Next episode, Lex is absolutely furious about this, and he spends the entire episode going on a witch hunt determining to figure out who it is. He eventually incorrectly assumes that it's Kelly and sets his sights on her. And because he's Lex and he gets what he wants, for now, the Borons lose another member and all of a sudden the tribes are tied again. At this point, my mind is officially blown. This was supposed to be boring. I was told this season had lackluster strategy and yet here we are with the majority tribe picking off their own. They went from the first tribe to have a numbers advantage going into the merge to all of a sudden being tied up midway through the merge. I have to give props to Tiber. Before watching this season, I thought everyone just liked her because of her inherent sheer charisma and likability, but I actually think this one moment might have been the best move anyone made all season. Think about it. If this had worked and Brandon hadn't flipped, the whole game changes, and Tiber could have guaranteed herself final four at least, if not the entire game. Who knows? If, like Kim, she wins her way to the end and finds herself sitting next to Frank, then she possibly wins the entire thing. All because of one little seed of paranoia that she planted all the way back at final nine. Granted, she couldn't have known this would have been the result. Who knows what she was hoping to accomplish by throwing a vote Lex's way, but the result still is that Lex and friends picked off one of their own and got the numbers to be even. And if Braden hadn't flipped, they would have been able to get Lex out right then and there. Unfortunately for her, Brandon did flip. Even though the numbers are tied, Brandon kind of became a Borean and therefore none of this came to pass. But to me, the interesting thing is that it well could have. If you know me, there's very little I find more intriguing about a season than when one little thing totally tips the scales and it could have gone a whole other way. Somewhere in a different timeline, the Borans vote Kelly, leaving Kelly to flip on the Borans and join the Samburus and vote off Lex. Lex becomes the first member of the jury again, and Ethan, Kim, Big Tom, and Kelly all get voted off before Final Four, and T-Bird once again becomes ineligible to be on Second Chance, not because the audience is stupid and would rather have Monica over her, but because she's not eligible for Second Chance because she won. Anyway, Lex actually cultivates a bond with Brandon despite the rest of the tribe deeming him a disloyal rat because of how easily he flipped on his tribe. This even makes Ethan and Big Tom, members of Lex's alliance, uneasy. Even Ethan and Tom, who are part of Lex's alliance, are uneasy on how quickly Brandon's alliances shifted. Lex is absolutely fine with this, proving once and for all that his disgust toward Boston Rob and All-Stars had nothing to do with Boston Rob not keeping his word or backstabbing alliances or throwing away his friendship for a million greenbacks, but because it involved voting out Lex. Brandon here is being just as disloyal as Boston Rob was to Lex and Kathy and All-Stars, but it's okay here because it involves protecting Lex. Not saying he's like an all-time great villain, I'm just saying, there it is. More of his will be nice and say double standards on display. Anyway, since Lex and Brandon are now in-game BFFs, it leaves the remaining members of both of their alliances a bit cold. Ethan and Tom even discuss if they should keep Lex, as it seems he cares less about the well-being of the alliance and more about his own self-preservation. Who knows? Maybe if Lex hadn't won, they would have actually voted him out. In all honesty, Ethan and Big Tom should be thanking Brandon for his disloyalty, because if he hadn't, they would have been kinda fucked. But I'm not going to hold it against them, even though I fundamentally disagree with this era's game theory. Theory that dictates honesty and integrity are more important than actually winning. Even though I don't agree with it, at the very least, Ethan and Big Tom are being honest about their principles in regards to Survivor. They don't condemn backstabbing and dishonesty while praising someone else for doing it five years earlier because it involved protecting them. I'm I'm being unnecessarily mean towards Lex, aren't I? Previous Ironclad Born Alliance is crumbling at the seams due to conflicting loyalties and priorities. They all want to protect themselves first and foremost, and because there can only be one winner, their goals are going to conflict. This is, at its core, the appeal of Survivor. Neither Ethan or Lex are actually villains in this story, they just have conflicting goals. And because this is the era from before Survivor was told strictly from the winner's perspective, neither of them are really the villain because neither of them are the sole narrator 
of this story. So this is all actually real interesting. Lex actually votes outside the majority of the season for the first time and only time ever besides his actual elimination, and he escapes the ire of the Alliance by constantly winning immunities until the whole thing blows over, and then they just quietly vote off the Samburus. And that's unfortunately where the season kind of deflates. Like I said, some of the best parts of Survivor are when the people realize that everyone's goals of winning are directly at odds and everyone acts accordingly. Someone's game plans directly interfere with someone else's game plans, preferably in their own alliance, like it does in this season. And that all kind of goes away when Brandon and Frank go home. After that, the alliance comes together, puts their history besides them, and gets on with doing what they should have been doing from the very start, which is eliminating the rival alliance. And a straightforward pergonging just isn't as interesting as alliance infighting. The brilliant tension and unpredictability of the first half of the season just kind of goes away. And it becomes a good, but not amazing, perfectly serviceable season of Survivor. I'd say the cast is strong enough to overcome this as the strong personalities of Ethan, Lex, Big Tom, and T-Bird are all strong enough to make this season Perfectly enjoyable, if nothing else. However, going back to the Lex and Boron split from before, there's actually one other aspect of the season that I find really interesting and speaks to issues that are actually bigger than Survivor Africa. During this time, Lex and Brandon want to eliminate Frank, while the Borans want to eliminate Brandon. Frank offers to create an alliance with Lex, and he just kind of outright says no and that he doesn't really want to work with him. He wants to work with Brandon. And that is interesting because it is not the only time the season positions Brandon and Franks as adversaries. Obviously, there is the divide between the older slash younger members of the Samburu tribe, but there's also Frank's problems with Brandon on a personal level. You see, Brandon is gay, and Frank is what you would call a hardcore conservative. He advocates against gun control, spouting the same regular bullshit about how, well, cars kill people, should we ban cars? There's like, there's everything else you could kill someone yeah, with, right. you know? A piece of fishing line I can kill somebody with. Over the head with the you know, the automobiles kill people every day. Drug overdose, malpractice, right. you know, just everything. All right, enough. And it's very outwardly homophobic in a way we haven't really seen on the show before. The closest thing would be Rudy's not in a homosexual kind of way, quote, but even then, Rudy and Richard were obviously friends, and the line is obviously meant to be a well-intentioned, innocently ignorant faux pas. This, on the other hand, is obviously coming from a deep-seated place of... Well, I don't have a better word for it than bigotry. I don't like criticizing people's actual morality on the show, because I understand that it's all an edited product of TV, reality television is very manipulative, and... Survivor shows you what they want to show you and what fits their overall narrative. But I don't think I'm saying anything controversial when I say this is hard to watch. Like, take this scene where Brandon and Frank win a reward and have to watch a movie together. Listen to how Frank describes the event like it's some sort of ordeal. <clears throat> take the cards that I'm dealt with and make the best of them. It was difficult enough for me personally, but hey, it's a movie. You be quiet and watch the damn movie. Yeah, the company could have been better, but we simply had popcorn, we pop, we watched a movie, it's history, it's over with, let's move forward. Obviously, no one's under any obligation to like anyone else, but come on, the subtext is apparent. There's a specific reason why he doesn't like Brandon. He doesn't agree with his lifestyle, and it's the most outwardly homophobic thing we've seen on the show, probably even to this day. I saw John, I thought he was a big time queer. I really don't know. He seems kind of rough and tough over here, but he does all the cooking. So, I don't know. I won't be sleeping next to him tonight. Usually scenes like this involve people innocuously asking questions to understand the enigma that are gay people. Not hateful, just clueless and unaware because apparently they've never hung around an actual gay person before. There's a bunch of little scenes like that all season, which are really fascinating taken in isolation. One of the most interesting aspects of revisiting older seasons like this is witnessing just how different society was back then. 2001 doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it's eye-opening how far we've come in two short decades. We have multiple scenes that play out differently now than when they did back then. Like the aforementioned scene where Big Tom asks Brandon if he's gay with some incredulousness and confusion. 
or the scene where Big Tom slaps Lindsay's butt after washing a tick off, or the scene where Big Tom looks down the girl's shirts while cleaning them. Huh. Then, of course, there's the infamous scene where Ethan and the rest of the tribe pick on Clarence because he ate slightly more cherries than he was supposed to. And, of course, the tribe responds accordingly. No, of course they don't. I'm sorry. Right I'm there. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. That's the, you only got to tell me once. Uh, but this issue is cut and dry. Okay. You that's blew what I want to hear. And we're, we're pissed off. off. And we now need to deal with a, a situation where we were starting to build trust. The trust has been broken, and it needs to be built from square one. We need to start That's over now, because right now, dismissed. we're all wondering if we can leave anybody alone. If you did that in the army, you made a bad call in the army, you'd be kicked out of there so Hell, fast. Hell, they'd shoot you. They'd shoot you. you. And seeing as how I'm not black, I'm not really well equipped enough to discuss stuff like this. But uh, rest assured, I have heard from many a people that this was a textbook case of a microaggression. The fact of the matter is that the tribe never really forgives Clarence for this rather victimless crime, and he receives a vote at every tribal council he attends except for one, because they found an excuse to relentlessly target him, and by God, they're going to use it. I have to reiterate, I don't think Ethan, Big Tom, or any of the rest of the tribe were being intentionally racist towards Clarence, but I do think this says more about how common stuff like this was during this era of Survivor, and... I couldn't ignore how common it was in Africa in particular. I'd like to make it clear that this season isn't really worse off because for the most part moments like this are rather innocuous. It's not like Worlds Apart or Island of the Idols where the conversation takes up the entire season. It's just a couple of moments here and there that happen often enough for me to notice and for me to want to talk about as clumsily and ill-equipped as I am to do so. It's not like Worlds Apart or Island of the Idols where it dominates the entire season but it happened enough for me to notice it and to want to talk about it as clumsily as I can. And to point out how far we've come, but also how far we still have yet to go. It's startling how easily you could imagine Frank making this argument that he made about gun control in 2021 as he did in 2001. Like, literally nothing seems to have changed in that respect. We like to think we've come so far, but we've got a long way to go. The Franks of the world have not gone away. If anything, they've just gotten louder. But overall, even with the less than stellar moments, this season was still perfectly delightful. The characters are well developed, the strategy was complex and layered, at least for the first half, and the location was stunningly beautiful in a sort of desolate kind of way. Overall, I would definitely give this season my stamp of approval.